Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, as we come to God's word this morning, an absolutely incredible passage of scripture, Galatians chapter 6. Looking at verse 14, just that one verse. The Apostle Paul writes, May I never boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Let's come to pray. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful privilege this Good Friday of being able to meet with you to study your word. Lord, may you speak into our hearts this morning. May your Holy Spirit move among us. May your Holy Spirit touch our hearts. May your Spirit move up and down the aisle and amongst the pews. And starting with myself, Lord, please speak. May your words this morning be Spirit-energized words. May your name be glorified. Lord, we know that a number of our folk are away. But Lord, may you speak into their hearts wherever they worship this morning. May your spirit move throughout today at our 10 o'clock service. Glorify your name. We commit all things to you for Jesus' sake. And God's people say, Amen. <clears throat> Starting during the Battle of Britain, again throughout the Second World War, the German Air Force, known as the Luftwaffe, repeat, had repeated bombing attacks against London and other cities in southern England. After the war, the rebuilding began. Large amounts of rubble had to be removed and cleared because of the amount of devastation wreaked against English cities. And as you turn and you look at photographs of that particular time period, in the midst of bombed out London, there is St. Paul's Cathedral, and right at the very top of that cathedral is a cross. A cross. One of the cathedrals that was heavily bombed during that war was Coventry Cathedral, which had to be heavily rebuilt due to the devastation that had been wreaked against it. And as they completed its reconstruction, years later a helicopter hovered over Coventry Cathedral and lowered a cross onto its highest point. I was looking at a military cemetery in Holland uh, recently, and each grave was marked by a wooden cross. 37,000 German soldiers are buried there. If you go to Belsen concentration camp, there is a 25 foot high cross standing in the fields next to that camp to remember those who died. If you climb to the top of Mount Everest, you will find in the snow right at its very peak a little wooden cross buried there by Sir Edmund Hillary, the first man to scale that mountain. Now for many of you here, you have a cross around your neck. Some of you ladies have crosses that hang from your earrings. A number of us have crosses that are in our homes, simply on our walls, as decoration. Now what I want to ask you here this morning is this. Is what does the cross mean to you? What does the cross mean to you? Why are all churches right across denominational lines represented by a cross? We have one here right at the very front of the church. We've got another one right at the back of the church. They're in glass. The church behind us is a huge cross mounted on its roof that lights up at night. In fact, the whole of the Christian world looks to the cross. When you turn and you read the writings of the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6 verse 14, Paul says that he boasted in it. Now, Paul could have boasted in his religion. He had been one of the most strict and religious Jewish Pharisees before he came to know Jesus Christ. 
He could have boasted in his Jewish background, for he was a man who had all the right pedigree, circumcised on the eighth day of Israel, from the tribe of Benjamin, and so on. He could have boasted in the fact that he was a Roman citizen, something that was not easy to get hold of in those particular days. He could have gloried and boasted in other things other than the cross of Jesus Christ, such as the miraculous birth of Jesus, that Jesus was born of a virgin. He could have gloried in the heart of God, that the Lord Jesus was one who was filled with incredible compassion and mercy and kindness towards mankind, that he cared for the poor, the needy, the sick, the blind, the lame, the crippled. He could have turned and boasted and gloried in Jesus' amazing resurrection and ascension back to God. And how one day at the return of Jesus Christ, Jesus is going to appear in the heavens and he is going to rule and govern this entire world. He could have sat back and he could have gloried in any one of those things, but he didn't. Instead, he turned around and said, no. And in Galatians 6 verse 14, he said, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Well, I want you to turn this morning and I want you to look at this cross with its red robe and its crown of thorns. And I want you to just think about it. And that it was one of the most cruel punishments ever practiced by a nation such as Rome. Every one of its details is absolutely horrific. Sometimes causing the victim uh, incredible pain to the point that the victim hung there and took days to die as he suffocated in excruciating agony. On this particular occasion that we remember here today in Jerusalem, the Romans went and crucified three people. Two thieves and Jesus right there in the middle. The crowds were in an uproar in the streets. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, procurator, knew that Jesus was innocent. But he didn't know what to do with Jesus. Just like many people today in our world do not know what to do with Jesus. And so Pilate tried to palm Jesus off onto King Herod, only to have Jesus sent back to him a few hours later. Then he tried to palm Jesus off that Good Friday onto the crowds, hoping that the crowds would turn and make a decision concerning the Christ. But in the final analysis, Pilate, like every single one of us here today in our own families, we need to make that decision for ourselves concerning who Jesus Christ actually is. The crowds had become a raging mob in the streets, shouting out, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! Crucify Him! All as thousands of people at one of the busiest religious feasts of the year got caught up in all the atmosphere and all the emotion of mob violence. In fact, history tells us that Jerusalem's population grew from 40,000 to 80,000 and sometimes to the 2 million mark. Thousands of foreigners coming into the city. Even if they didn't know who he was, they got caught up in all the emotion of the time. Just like many of us here get caught up in all the mentality and the motion of mob mentality in South Africa today. And that if we are honest, how many people don't have time for God this weekend? Don't have time for church or for prayer or for Jesus these days or even to go home and to read the word of God every single day of the week. But instead in our lives we're just far too busy, too busy, caught up with all the constant rush of daily life. Caught up with work and issues at home and children and tiredness and pleasures. So that for many in the crowd, the mob, life is too busy. We're living life continually on the run. Even for us here as Christians, there's just no time. Too tired, too tired for God. Mob rule. And so they reached out and they took Jesus. One who had been unjustly arrested and sentenced. And while the crowds were in a wild uproar out there in the streets, Roman soldiers watching with, with absolute fidgety, soldiers came and they took Jesus into the minor courtyard of the palace. For you see, Jesus, in the plan of God, had to go to the cross. 
with the full knowledge of what he had to suffer, willingly and knowingly, for yours and my personal sin today. And so God the Father in heaven presented Jesus the bitter cup. And as Jesus' tormentors led Jesus into that courtyard, they hauled him before a blood-stained, blackened pillar, scarred with all the blood of criminals, and hanging there from two chains with two cuffs, iron cuffs. And you can just imagine that unruly mob of cursing pagan soldiers, filled with vulgarity and brutal, standing around, their eyes gleaming in expectation. You can imagine that gleam of anticipation in their eyes as they reached out to the Son of God. And they pulled those hands to those cuffs. Hands that had never ever gone and committed a crime. Hands that had reached out in compassion and love and healed the sick, raised the dead, fed the hungry from a few loaves of bread and two fish. The hands of God. And they reached out. And they took those hands, those same hands, and they tied them to that pillar. Pulling the clothes off his back, they picked up the cat of nine tails. Having lumps of lead at the end of those tails, filled and fitted with bone. And again and again a soldier stepped forward and he brought that whip down with full force against Jesus' shoulders and his back and his legs. And according to medical research, at first there was an oozing of blood from the capillaries in the veins. And then finally arterial bleeding. Heavy bruising. And the soldiers stood back and they laughed. Forty lashes they threw against him. While Jesus, the Son of God, screamed. The one who created the world. The one in love who designed you and created you. He was then untied and allowed to slump onto the stone pavement while the Roman soldiers stood back laughing at him, laughing at him. There was no mercy on him, lying there wet in his own blood, while heaven itself did absolutely nothing to intervene. All as he went through it, to show the power of God's love for you. Being punished for you. Taking your place today as a substitute before God for your sin. For every ounce of rebellion in your life that you have ever gone and committed against God. He was a tortured man for you. But not only was he a tortured man, but he was a mocked man. In that you see, secondly, they had just finished beating him. And then another horrible trial episode then begins. And this time it wasn't physical against the Lord Jesus Christ. This time it was mental. And that they pulled him away from that stone pillar. And as they did so, they threw an old purple robe across Jesus' shoulders. Because you see, purple is the color of a king. And while they did that, another soldier weaved a crown of thorns. And he took that crown and then he went and pressed it into Jesus' scalp. Just like that crown of thorns there. Causing copious bleeding. All because, you see, they wanted to mock his kingly deity. He's the king of the Jews, they laughed. Rex, if they want him. And they laughed at him to scorn. While a soldier stepped forward with a reed and began to strike Jesus against the face again and again and again and then striking him across the head, driving that crown deeper and deeper into his own skull. And he, the Son of God, he allowed it. He allowed it. Because he loved you. He loved you. He loves each and every one of you. Till finally they tired of their sport. A soldier stood up. He walked towards Jesus. He took hold of that purple robe on Jesus' back. 
A robe that had been glued to Jesus' back by the blood and dried serum. And he ripped it off. Caused an excruciating pain while Jesus screamed out. And they laughed at him, laughed at him. Hail, King of the Jews. And do you know why Jesus allowed it? Because he loved you. He loves you. Do you know why they did it? Because they didn't believe he was a king. They didn't see him as God's only son. They didn't believe it. Can you hear this scorning laughter? Hundreds of soldiers in the courtyard of the barracks. And you know, that is how it is for many people right across our world today. Maybe even somebody sitting here. And that there are thousands of people in Johannesburg who do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He was a King. They do not believe He's God's Son. They do not believe that He is relevant to their own lives today. Or that He has a message for you and I. Or that Jesus will make a mark on yours and my eternity. And that is why you will find thousands of people who will spend this entire weekend focused on themselves and their own plans, having dismissed the Son of God in their lives for eternity. And then I want you to see, with regards to the Savior, that he was a rejected man. And that here was a man who was sent from heaven to die for the sins of the world. Think of who he was. He came from the heart of God. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. His heart was filled with compassion. Touching people. Meeting people's needs on a daily basis. One who came to bear people's punishment. Well, any reasonable person would have sat back and thought that if there was such a man who came from heaven, that he ought to be loved. He ought to be welcomed. Someone would have sat back and possibly thought that the whole world would have made this man welcome, saying, come, Jesus, come, you're most welcome, come, but nothing of the sort. Instead, as Pilate sat on that balcony, overlooking the rioting and cheering crowds that were in the streets that day, Two prisoners were brought out before him. And did you see it was the custom at that time of the year as a sign of Roman favor, a sign of Roman magnanimity that one prisoner would be presented to the people of Israel and they could ask for which one they wanted to be released to the people. And so one prisoner was placed on each side of Pilate. And as Pilate looked at the crowds, he raised his hand and he called for silence. And he turned around and he said, Whom should I free to you? Jesus or Barabbas? Now Barabbas was a murderer. That's what he was. He was a murderer. And so Pilate, knowing the hearts and the lives of the two men, he believed that the people out there in the streets would turn and cry out for Jesus. He was a righteous man. He was a good man. He was tzaddik, but to his utter astonishment, they shouted for Barabbas. And when he turned and he cried out to the crowds, what should I do with Jesus, the one who is called the king of the Jews? They shouted louder, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And the world is no different today, is it? In fact, the average man out there in the street would turn around and say to you, don't you talk to me about your religion. I don't want to talk to you about your Jesus. I don't want to talk about Jesus and the Bible and God. I don't want to talk about that. Maybe you've had people turn around and say that to you. I don't want to talk to you about your faith. Or I'll think about religion when I'm good and ready. Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Nobody is neutral. Nobody is neutral. Let me ask you this. How do you relate to Jesus 
this Good Friday. Now, I'm not asking you if you're a signed member of Reach South Africa, because the church can't save you. I'm asking you about Jesus, for He changes lives. He brings forgiveness into the human heart. He is the only one who can touch your life and the lives of your loved ones and save them. As Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto God the Father but through me. For those that reject Jesus Christ, have they found anything better? Not a chance. As we come to a close, I also want you to remember that Jesus was a victorious man. If you had been standing in the crowd that day in the streets with, the, with all the rioting going on, and you would have looked up on the balcony outside that, that, that palace, you would have seen Jesus standing in the corner next to Pilate, covered in blood. Thorns pushed deep down into his forehead. His face swollen from the beating. His arms and his legs and his back would have been covered in blood and deep scars and lacerations. So much so that the prophet Isaiah went and wrote in Isaiah 53 verse 3. 470 years before it happened, he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide what? Their faces. He was despised and as we esteemed him not. Can you see it? What I'm saying to you he was a victorious man. You might not have thought so as you stood there in that crowd that day. You might have seen him as a poor, miserable victim of Roman injustice. But he wasn't. Underneath that battered exterior, he was still a king. He was still the son of God. The crowds and the Romans might not have understood it. But as he stood there, he had his eyes firmly fixed on your salvation. Firmly fixed on it. In that play called A Man Born to be King by Dorothy L. Sayers, she portrays it this way. She shows Jesus stumbling along the road towards the cross. And as he walks, he falls. And the Roman soldiers reach out to take the cross from him. And suddenly a woman in the crowd says, look, look, he's reaching out to take that cross back. You couldn't have taken the cross away from my Jesus, my Savior. You couldn't have taken away his sufferings. Because he did it out of love for you. He loved you. And suffer he did. On arriving at Golgotha, a Roman soldier would have quickly thrown Jesus backward with all his shoulders against that wooden beam. And then the soldiers would have felt for that depression in front of Jesus' wrist. And then finding a heavy square iron nail, they would have picked up the hammer and started to smash that nail through Jesus' wrist into the wood. And then they would have pulled the cross up while well, Jesus in absolute agony as gravity literally pulled his body down on those nails, screamed. Another soldier would have grabbed Jesus' right foot and then extended both feet. And a soldier would have driven a nail through the arch of each foot. Again, while Jesus screamed out in pain, crying in agony, can you hear it for you? And now Jesus was a suffered excruciating, fiery pain. All of his weight literally hung on those nails. While fiery pain would have been shooting along his fingers into his arms while he sobbed. And then the nails in his wrists would have put terrible pressure upon the median nerves. To avoid the torment, Jesus would have tried to push himself up by putting the pressure on that nail in his feet as he did so and he cried in agony. And then at that point, another phenomenon occurs. 
Terrible cramps sweeping through his muscles, throbbing pain. Jesus hanging from his arms. He can't breathe. Gasping, gasping. But do you know that the Son of God stayed there? Stayed there. Do you know why he stayed there? Because he loved you. He loves you this Friday. He loved you. You see, only in Jesus Christ do you have forgiveness of sins. He was bearing our sins on that cross. People turn and they ask me, Is there any hope for me? Can Christ save me? People from all walks of life have asked me over the years here. I've had murderers from gangs. I've had prisoners coming to see me. I've had prostitutes and alcoholics. Is there any hope for me? People who have done many wicked things, both corporately and privately. Is there any hope for me? Paul turned and he gloried in the cross. For it was the only way that man can be saved. In Acts 4 verse 12, the apostle Peter stood up and he said, Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to a man by which he may be saved than through Jesus Christ. Are you saved this morning? For Jesus was tortured for you out of love to make you right with God. Right now. Tell me, how did Jesus come to save you? How are you saved? But by faith. That is in you believing who he is and what he went and did for you. And then repenting. That's turning away from your sin. As you turn and call upon him to forgive you and be your savior. That's why Jesus went to the cross. In God's holy economy, sin had to be punished. And so God out of love sent his only son in the world to take away your sin. So that you could have life. The story is told of a minister who as he preached, he mentioned the two thieves on the cross. And somebody in the congregation shouted out, And what about the thief? And what about the thief? And the minister replied, Which one? You see, one was saved, one was lost. Which are you? Let's pray. Perhaps God has spoken into your heart this Good Friday. Don't you speak to the Lord about your life? About what Jesus Christ should mean to you? Perhaps you've never committed your life to Christ wholeheartedly. Won't you do that now? Maybe you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. Won't you give thanks to Christ right now? In John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Father in heaven, we give you praise again this morning. We thank you for what Good Friday means. May you speak into our hearts. May you help us today to carry the message continually before us. Remembering this day what you did for us. May we live humble and godly lives. Lives fully committed to you. 
where we have sinned and rebelled against you, may we repent of that and turn and embrace you. For there is no other way into eternity and into the presence of God than through your Son, Jesus Christ. Glorify your name. God's people say, Amen. Amen.